This episode of our Mac Tip series is a little bit more advanced, but fear not because I'm here to help you through it. I'm introducing you to the command line and homebrew, tools designed primarily for developers, but with a few really cool options and utilities for normal Joes like you and I. Let's get started. Everything we're going to be doing today takes place inside of the command line or terminal. If you've never used terminal before, you can navigate to applications and then the utility subfolder and you'll find it inside, or you can search it via Spotlight. Once you open Terminal, you'll find a window that looks something like this. Now, before we can do anything with Homebrew, we actually need to install it. And so if you've installed the Xcode tools before, you will be able to skip this step. If you haven't, you most likely haven't, type the following command, Xcode dash select space dash dash install. By the way, for the record, if you miss one of these commands, and, and you probably will, they're all linked down below in raw text. So you can actually copy and paste them into the terminal window really easily. So I get an error because my command line tools have already been installed. If you haven't installed them yet, you'll be prompted to do so, and that takes a couple of minutes. Once we've installed those tools, we can actually install Homebrew. Now this is a long command, so I would recommend copying and pasting. But once you paste it, it's going to ask you if you want to continue by pressing return. We will say yes. We'll need to give it our admin password on our Mac, and then it's going to go to town. This also takes a couple of minutes. Once we have the Xcode Select Tools and Homebrew installed, it's ready to get messing around with some cool utilities. So let's start it off. The first utility we're going to talk about is called Cask. Cask is incredibly powerful. It allows you to download, install, maintain updates, and uninstall non-Mac App Store applications. There's a lot of apps for Mac, and a lot of them are not on the Mac App Store. This utility, Cask, allows you to basically maintain them without having to go online and Google the file and download the file and then install it through the installer and then make sure it stays updated and get bombarded. No, 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 Cask does all of that for you. It's one of my favorite utilities and it's super, super powerful. To install it, you just type brew install Cask and Homebrew will fetch the package file and install it for you. It can take a couple of seconds. Now that Cask is installed, we can start working with it. Now I should know that all of these utilities are insanely powerful and I couldn't possibly talk about everything they're capable of in this video. So if you ever wanna know what they can do, or if you ever get stuck, type brew for Homebrew, then the name of the package or utility you're trying to use, so in this case, Cask, and then type help. And a list of commands along with descriptions on what those commands do will pop up and show you basically how to use it. So first of all, let's do brew search casks. This will show us the entire catalog or list of hundreds of casks that are available to us. So you can see just how insanely, I mean, there are tons and tons of Mac apps that are listed in this section that you can install using cask. Now, this isn't very helpful sorting through this big massive list. So there's a built-in search functionality from within cask. You can type brew, search, and then the name of an app. So let's say, I don't know, Discord. If we type enter, Cask will try and locate that package, and if it returns a result, you can see there you go, there's the Discord app that we need to install. So if we want to actually install Discord, we can type brew, cask, install, and Discord. And it will download that package and install it for us. <laughs> really pretty awesome. So it's downloading it right now. It will install it without ever you popping up an installer file. So once we get to the end, no installation, it does it all automatically. And then if we open Spotlight and type Discord, there it is. That's pretty awesome, isn't it? Now, if you want to update stuff, I can type brew, cask, and then upgrade. And that will upgrade every single application that is installed using cask on my Mac. And you can see, because I've only installed Discord and it's already up to date, there's no casks to upgrade. But this is a super amazing option if you ever have a lot of apps that are always bombarding you for updates, especially the crappy apps that take you back to Safari to re-download the app and it's, ugh, it's awful. Just use cask. The second utility is kind of a strange one, but it's a really cool one. It's called HTOP. So you've probably used Activity Monitor before, and if you haven't, well, this is Activity Monitor. <laughs> if your computer is slowing down or whatever, you can kind of see what the different processes are and kill them directly from this application. It also shows you your CPU load, uh, how much memory you're using, stuff like that. But this application, I don't know, I've never found it to be well laid out and it doesn't show you graphically how much resources you're using. And so HTOP is a really, really great alternative. You can install it by typing brew, install, HTOP, and it will download and install it. 
Once it's installed, we can type sudo htop. Now we need to use super user privileges. It's going to ask for our password because we are actually monitoring the hardware on the Mac, which Mac OS requires hardware level permissions for. So once we enter that, it will show us this very cool representation of how our system resources are being used. You can actually see the per thread usage on my eight core 16 thread CPU. You can see a graphical representation of how much memory is being used. You can also see your uptime, the number of tasks, and you can manage filter, search, and kill tasks all from this window using the function keys. It's really, really powerful and really awesome if you're trying to seed out or find some little spooky application that's consuming more resources than it should. HTOP is pretty slick. Next, speedtest.net. Sometimes you need to run a speed test, but going to speedtest.net is a real nightmare. They have a crappy website. It uses tons of resources. It's just bad. Well, you can do that from the command line. If you type brew install speedtest-cli for command line interface, it will install. And once it's installed, we can enter speedtest-cli, and it will actually run a speedtest.net speed test without having to navigate to the web browser. You don't have to load the massive web page and have the ads on the side. It's all done directly through the command line, which is pretty slick. So right now it's testing my download speed. That has finished. It will test my upload speed, and it will tell me the results. Yes, my office internet is pretty crappy. Are these getting a bit too out into the woods for you? All right, let's take it back to an easy one. This is YouTube DL. It's pretty simple, YouTube download, that's right. You can install it by typing brew install YouTube-DL. You're also going to need to install FFmpeg if you wanna download videos in a resolution above 720p, which you probably do. So type brew install YouTube-DL and then FFmpeg. Press enter, and it goes to town. YouTube DL is one of those utilities that is hyper powerful. So to really get a full scope of what it's capable of, you should consult the help documentation. But the formula that I most frequently use to download the highest resolution uh, video available is the following. First of all, we're going to need to copy the URL of the video we'd like to download to our clipboard. So go to Safari, find a video you like, copy, and then type the following command, YouTube-DL minus F, best video, so we're requesting the highest resolution available, plus best audio. And again, you can define these manually. You can define the exact resolution that you want to download it to if you'd like, but these are the defaults. And then you type the URL. YouTube DL goes out, fetches the video, and then shows you the download pro uh, progress on the 583.33 megabyte file. Now it's saving in a .webm. .webm is not natively supported inside of Mac OS X, so it's actually going to download the file first, and then it converts it using FFmpeg to an MP4 by default. But you can leave it as a WebM if you'd like, or change it to any file format you can desire using one of YouTube DL's very, very powerful utilities. Just be sure to read through this help documentation because it can do a lot. And it's slicker than a GUI-based YouTube downloader. Okay, you know what they say, the best for first and last. I don't admittedly use Homebrew all that often. I do use Cask almost on the daily, and this is the other application that I use all the time. It's called Image Magic. You can install it by typing brew, install, and then Image Magic. Image Magic is really powerful. Basically, you provide an input file, a photo of any resolution, size, shape, what have you. You can define some effects that you'd like to apply if desired, and then you can choose an export resolution. Uh, different file formats, different sizes, doesn't matter. Image Magic will handle everything. Let me show you some of the commands that I use with frequency. So you do need to manually define your input and output files. I could do that by just dragging this field.jpg file directly into the finder. That shows the path. But it, I also need to provide an output path, which I have yet to do. By default, it saves into the root of your home folder. But what I would recommend is just defining the folder manually before you start working with uh, the, the utility. So I type cd desktop, for example, to set my main directory as the desktop. So any file name that I type is going to be assumed that it's on this folder. And when I choose my output file, I can just type the name of the file and it will assume the same path to the desktop. So let's show you an example of something that I do actually pretty frequently. So let's do convert. We need to provide our input file now. So let's do the field.jpg photo. We can type field.jpg, okay. And then we need to, I don't know, let's say, uh, let's add a border. We can type border. We can then type what resolution or what size we want our border to, to be. Let's do, let's do a big one. Let's do 30 pixels by 30 pixels. And then we need to define the border color. Let's make that 
white. And then we need to output our file. So we'll call this bordered dot, let's do PNG. Okay, so we're gonna change the file format. If I press enter, there you go. I have a new folder, a new file called border.png. Not only did it change the file format from JPEG to PNG, but surely enough, it added a 25, or was it 30? A 30 pixel border around our image. Pretty cool. Okay, so what else can it do? Uh, let's try a different command, something I would try frequently. So let's do convert. Let's do this same field.jpg folder or file. And let's say it's too big. That did take a while. It's clearly a large file. So let's see what resolution are we working with here. 3840 by 2160. If we zoom up on screen, you can see that it is quite massive. Yeah, that's definitely beyond 1080p. So let's go back to our terminal window. Let's change the resolution of this file. So we are going to type uh, resize, and then you can type uh, the the length resolution that you'd like. So we could do like 1920 if we wanted to do 1920 by 1080. You can do any arbitrary number you want and it will resize, it will maintain the aspect ratio and resize it. So I could do like 1654 if I wanted to um, and it will resize it properly, maintaining it 16 by nine format. Now, if you wanted to find the other, uh, the other uh, length. So instead of doing 1920, instead of doing the the long length, if we wanted to do the short length of the photo, um, we could do uh, X1080, and that will still provide us a 1920 by 1080 format. Or you can define the exact resolution you want to export to if you know, and it will conform regardless. Um, so let's just do 1920. Okay, so we're going to resize it to that, and then we're going to change it uh, back to, let's change it to a, a TIFF file, for example. So we're gonna call it export.tiff. We press enter, and surely enough, it pops up. There it is, ready for viewing, in a much smaller, much more digestible resolution. To give you an example of how truly powerful image magic is, let me show you a power user demonstration. So we're gonna say for files that end in .jpg, so any file on the desktop ending in .jpg, so that's gonna be these two files, obviously. Let's, um, well, let's do convert them, keeping their original file name intact. Uh, convert, sorry. Uh, well, let's change the resolution first. So we are going to say resize, and rather than manually defining a resolution, I, I could do that if I wanted, but these are different size files. So let's resize them to 50% of their original size. And then we are going to change the name of the export file to not just the same name, but we're gonna change it to small dash, and then use the original file name. So now what's going to happen, if we press enter, is it is going to export two photos. It has the same names they had before, but adds small as a prefix, because that's one of the things we requested. And if we note the resolution, let's look at this one, so command I, we can see that this one is 500 by 478 pixels. If we go to this one, we'll see that it is 250 by 239 pixels. So it's exactly the same image, just a little bit smaller. Image magic is crazy powerful. Well, folks, if you enjoyed this video, please give it a like. If you didn't, well, that other button seems to work okay too. Get subscribed for more awesome tech videos like these, but most importantly, and as always, stay snazzy.